the first thing I want to ask you guys about is you've made this really wonderful film that's about science. It's about the way science affects people's lives. It's about the way people can affect science lives. But I feel like this movie also has just the tiniest bit of magic in it. That this is a movie that also is about two people with the same passion, the same goals in life, happening to grow up in the same small town. And it made me wonder, do the two of you believe in fate at all? That's such a great question. That might be one of my favorite questions I, I think we've ever gotten. So just thank you for those kind words and thank you for that question. Um, stories like this make me question fate and relate to fate in a profoundly different way than I ever have before. Um, I can't say that I necessarily believe in it, but I believe when you pursue something that feels like your authentic truth and when you live your life in a way where meaning is at the very center of it, it might feel like fate because you're doing what you dream of doing. It's uh, what enriches your life. And, and for Katya and Maurice, that was the pursuit of volcanoes, this grand mystery, which of course mystery and magic go hand in hand. And it was being in love with each other and with the earth. So in that way, it's almost like um, there's a faded quality to that. But I feel like it was something that uh, was not a choice for them because they loved it so much. That's how they had to live. But what, what do you think? Um. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I believe that there's a, a cause behind the cause behind the cause of all things, and we live in the concatenation of all things. But, I, but I, at the same time, I think it's beyond our understanding um, that what, it, what appears to be the, the truth that I'm able to touch is that it's mysterious. And the reason why something happens may be, may be ordained or destined or fated, but it's, it's beyond my comprehension. But that, that complex, the contradiction of that is what makes things interesting and what makes, I think, was, was what made Maurice and Katya want to always strive to, to touch what seems impossible to do any other way or to live in a way where there was no other choice but to live as you felt you had to. But I, I mean, kind of on that note, like you pointed out that there's, um, it feels like they are drawn to this idea of mystery. And I think that's fascinating that you two are documentary filmmakers making a film about people who also were, in a way, documentary filmmakers, documenting their experience, having, making films to fund their work. And they, are, they definitely seem to believe in some sort of mystery to make peace with mystery, which I feel like there are two kind of schools of thought of it in documentary. Some people are like, I must get to the truth. And some people are like, the world is a little bit mysterious. Where do you guys fall on that spectrum? That's a great question. I, I would say I think for Katya and Maurice, I feel like the truth is mystery in a way. Like those two things are joined together. Um, I feel like with them, they understood the ultimate unrequitedness of being human. Of They were in pursuit of, of this geologic force that was so beyond human understanding, which in their own words. Um, but going towards that, trying to understand it, brought them a, a higher sense of truth and, and kind of a, a feeling of the divine, even though they didn't use religious terminology themselves. Um, so in that way, yeah, I, I feel like there's a truth quality to, to that purity of their pursuit that at once was all about mystery. Um, and that's something that um, I, I feel so inspired by them, and, and it's been such a joy to get to be immersed in their lives that uh, I'm, I'm a disciple of Katya and Maurice. <laughs> I worship at their volcano temple. Um, so I, I would probably consider myself in, in that camp as well. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> He's worried about getting yelled at about the microphone again. <laughs> give me two mics. <laughs> but I think all of us here now feel so close to Katya and Maurice having seen this film, you know, two people that we'll never get to meet, that we'll never have a chance to meet. And, you know, you have spent so much time with them going through all of this footage, 250 hours, I think, all together. When did, as your interpreters of Katya and Maurice, when did the two of you decide to represent them as Katya is a bird and, and Maurice is an elephant seal? You're asking such great questions. These are really making me smile because I, I feel like you're, you're seeing into like so many of the things that um, we spent so much room talking about in the edit room. Um, do you want to take this one? Or you want? Yeah. OK, I'll start. Please, please chime in. Uh, Katya is a bird. Maurice's is an elephant seal was actually extremely early on in our process. We, uh, the footage, as you said, we were working with about 250 hours. There's about 200 hours of 16 millimeter footage that Katya and Maurice shot. And then there's about 50 hours of footage that was them on television programs and, and largely Francophone Western Europe, um, documentaries that other people had made. Um, the 16 millimeter footage had no sound. <laughs> and it was 
absolutely spectacular, but also extremely difficult to work with. Aside from lacking sound, it was like you know two seconds of one shot, five seconds of another shot, 10 seconds of something that made absolutely no sense that had nothing to do with volcanoes whatsoever. So the editorial process w was, was quite difficult, but it was also really special. Um, but um, basically, uh, we're working with, with these kinds of materials, um, Sorry, I'm like losing my train of thought because I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the footage. Um, help me out here. What am I, where am I going with this? Um, I don't know where you're going, but I can jump in. Yeah, yeah. go for it. No, I'm, I'm going to come back to it. I think one of the things that's interesting about that, this, this, the distinction, oh, yes. go for it. No, go no, 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 go for it. The distinction between Maurice and Katya, you know, there's something in a, in a love affair where you enter into a place of, of oneness, of togetherness, but there's also the importance of differentiation. And I think for them, we learn so much about them as a unit through understanding them as different beings with different purposes, different hopes, ideals, uh, priorities. And through that, through their individual priorities, you got to see the relationship between them and how they were able to unify, unify them in a sort of love affair and in a, in a pursuit of something that was beyond what they could do as a unit together and certainly what they could do as differentiated beings. Well, and you kind of capture them. You capture that in the film. They also, there was, there's Katia and Maurice, and then there's Katia and Maurice, the people performing the act of being scientists on a camera. And you know, there's kind of a distinction between those two things. But I'm wondering, when you're just looking at these tiny snippets of film, how could you tell when you're seeing authentic, the authentic crafts and the, the stage-managed crafts? That, that's a, a great question, and, and I remembered what I meant to say, so thank you for bearing with me. But in, in those shards of footage that we were looking at, there was gorgeous imagery of Katya playing with the birds, and then there was footage of Maurice beckoning and, and challenging these elephant seals, and each of them instantly made us think, like, these feel like kind of a crystallization of their personalities in a way, um, and we decided to experiment with them. Um, and the more we learned about them, the more that was confirmed, uh, so much so that in their obituary, um, one of their dear friends wrote about how Katya was a pilot fish and Maurice was a whale following her. And pilot fish and, and whale are, are quite different, but at the same time, there's an essential character that's similar. And that's really what I felt like kind of our process of learning about them was, was like. There was initial interpretations where we would try to intuit something from the footage um, and have to question, is this them, um, you know, enacting performativity, uh, you know, displaying their characters for the camera? Or is this really who they are? But we realized that they always were actually enacting versions of themselves. They weren't inauthentic, but they realized the savviness of their performativity and how that could f interest people in the science of, doc of, um, of volcanology, how it could bring people to love the earth. Um, so there's um, a lot of utility in, in doing that. Um, and it was really interesting. The more people we talked to, the more we learned about them, the more those things got to be confirmed. So. Yeah, they were, they were storytellers as scientists, they were storytellers as filmmakers, and then they were storytellers as human beings and as performers of themselves. I mean, what, what do you make of Maurice as a cinematographer? I mean, I will say he does seem to have a thing about zooming into people's butts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there's some really funny footage, actually. Of, yeah, he, he had a really good sense of humor in terms of framing. Um, I, I think that Maurice was, and Katya too, were so in, in love with the earth and that drew them to find the most um, kind of beautiful and interesting ways of lensing the earth. Um, I feel like their frame always captured a sense of sentience, particularly. Uh, the earth always felt so alive. I remember some of the first footage we ever came into contact with were these close-ups of lava in Hawaii. Um, where it really does look like this oozing, breathing, kind of monstrous beast that you can't help but be so entranced by. Um, but when you really think about the, the, tech, the techniques of this, he was, must have been leaning over this incredibly hot earth. Um, and so the sacrifice that went into it. Um, but you're right, they, they were actually, uh, seemed to be very influenced by the French New Wave. And many kind of aesthetics of that, that movement show up in, the, in, for example, Maurice's cinematography, like the snap zooms. Um, so that was really fun for us to not just play with in our own editing, but it also kind of taught us, OK, this is something that was meaningful to them. Let's embrace that in our own storytelling. Let, let's kind of adapt some of the other kind of, uh, yeah, the signs of the French New Wave. Um, so yeah, that's but, for us. But the, the butt zooms were also part of, their, part of their aesthetic, but also part of their philosophy. You know, they, they, were, they were deeply immersed in existentialist, existentialism. And 
Um, what became obvious in, in getting to go on this journey with Maurice and Katya was that they understood that the world had the absurd um, inside of every fabric of it, and you couldn't engage in a serious pursuit without also being playful and without also recognizing the absurdity of life. And, and that is a part of their, that's a part of their filmmaking, it's a part of their conversations. And, and we try to adopt that as well as a filmmaking team, um, plenty of absurdity in the process of making this film. Well, yeah, I mean, I love that you have your little notes, like um, playing a little trill of, I think it was like Enya Morricone maybe over some of the footage. And it got me thinking like, man, I wonder if they ever had time just to go to the movies to keep up with like what was in theaters. But I'm, I mean, I'm so curious. Yeah, like you've kind of referred to this idea of seeing this footage for the first time. I'm, I'm imagining like you two as filmmakers really getting your first glimpses at stuff like people in silver suits in front of a wall of flames or people standing in lava that's like shooting fire all over their feet or people holding giant turnips. And I'm like wondering, that almost feels if, like a gauntlet thrown. Like for you as filmmakers, were you ever in the back of your heads like, am I willing to really put my life on the line like that to get some of these shots? You wanna start? Um, yeah, it, it was endlessly baffling the lengths that Katya and Maurice went to capture their imagery. Um, there was imagery that, yeah, we had never seen before that felt so surreal where we were just wondering how did they capture this? And then we'd read about how they captured it. I should mention, aside from the hundreds of hours of footage that they took, they wrote nearly 20 books and those were instrumental for us in really kind of understanding the play-by-play -play of how they got the footage, where they went, who they went there with. Um, and they just went to absolutely extraordinary lengths. Um, but I, I think being a documentary filmmaker, I personally feel like I have my absolute dream job. And I understand that that just intoxicating quality of um, when you're in a place that's just full of, you know, that transcendent beauty, you can't help but kind of surrender and, and go forth. And, and I, I wouldn't say that I, I haven't experienced the same kind of danger or adrenaline rush that Katya and Maurice perhaps had at the, you know, the lip of a crater. Um, but I do understand what it what it feels like to just so be immersed and to just follow. So um, I, I feel like there's a lot that we can learn as as filmmakers from Katya and Maurice and the boldness that they uh, that they employed to kind of pursue their their quest for knowledge and also um, capturing imagery. Yeah, and I, I think the larger lesson is they they did what they had to do to live the life that they had to live, and theirs was as theirs their life had to be as volcanologists traveling to the, the edge of the abyss. Ours is a little bit different as filmmakers and maybe in, in our current moments, but I feel, I feel committed to that pursuit in a different way. And I know that this is a conversation we had with our other you know, two core collaborators, our editors, uh, Aaron Casper and Jocelyn Chapu, and our other producer, Ina Fitchman. I think all of us recognize that if we were gonna make this movie about Maurice and Katya, we had to sort of live the life in a way, even though that looks radically different. But what parts of the story were missing for you guys? Because you also, it looks like, you know, take the time to shoot outside footage, to shoot, you know, overhead shots of coffee cups, to create, um, uh, to create like animations of how earth plates move, of tectonics. Like, how did you guys go about? Because this is a very small team, as you said, that put this together, coming up with where you needed to step in and say what they hadn't had a chance to say. That's a, that's a really good question. Um... For us, there it, it was always there were we we wanted the unknowns to also have their own space and to be articulated as unknowns that we could never answer nor ever attempt to fill. That was really important to first just pay homage to the process because Katya and Reese died, you know, 30 years before we ever began working on this project. And no matter how much research we did, no matter how many people we talked to, who knew them, who lived with them, there was still those questions that we could never directly ask them. Um, there's, of course, the great unknown that are volcanoes and the unknowns of the human heart. So it was essential to preserve that, that theme without trying to paper over it too much to presume that we had all the answers. We, we certainly didn't. Um, that said, there were some tones and, and feelings um, and imagery that we did think could, could help kind of almost articulate what we didn't have. Um, the coffee cups, of course, were, were some of them trying to kind of play, be playful with the story of how they came together. But we were really excited to actually embrace the idea of a collage film, and specifically the, the collection of imagery that Katya and Maurice themselves accumulated. Um, they had thousands and thousands of scientific illustrations of volcanoes dating back, I, I believe, to almost the 14th century. 
Um, and we used those imagery, um, those images as kind of the, the inspiration for our animation. So it was kind of like a nod to this other archival layer um, that at once could kind of play with the whimsy and the feeling of falling in love, but a specific falling in love over books, which is how they met. So those kinds of pieces helped to fill in some of the gaps and shape the kind of rise and fall as well as the tone of, of their story. Um, but hopefully not in a way that felt like we were trying to to draw a bridge over the unknown. But yeah, what, what would you say? Did you wrestle with telling the audience that they died at the beginning rather than sort of building to it at the end? It was actually pretty early on that we made that decision. Um, I think it was in our in our second cut. We we decided to to say that they that you know tomorrow will be their their last day. Um, there was a few reasons for that. Um, first, we, we thought that if we didn't spell it out, that the audience would always be wondering, you know, are they going to die here? Is this when it happens? Do they die? Do they live? And we wanted to kind of clear out that narrative space so you could really instead focus on how they lived, because that's really what this film is about, is, is the rich kind of meaningful life of Katya and Maurice Kraft. Um, time is also a major theme in the film, you know, uh, the precarity of a human life set against geologic time and so we thought that if we set kind of a human clock early on it would kind of conjure kind of an elegiac quality that you knew that there every every second was meaningful um so those were some of the major considerations uh we also didn't want their death to be sensationalized in any kind of way it it, it in our minds if it was kind of a third act twist it would have felt um a bit disrespectful and perhaps over dramatized um, and the fact that for them, death was such a part of their life, it, it didn't feel true to them either. Like there was always an acknowledgement that death was, was omnipresent. So it seemed like it had to be kind of woven into the fabric of the film early on. Yeah, and then I think just lastly, it, it helped us center the idea that when you die, is, the death is not the end. And I think if we, were, if we were to set it up in another way, without putting death in the beginning, we would, we would lose track of that. And then we would lose some of the themes that you were talking about initially, which is just that their, their pursuit of creating a myth that would outlive their, their human life, um, we, we may not access that point as clearly if we didn't start with death. I mean, you make so many, I think, really fun and clever choices in setting the tone and kind of getting us all on board for this film, you know, that just to make it scientific and playful and full of heart at the same time. I mean, I do love your music, which is like, it goes rock and roll, pop ballads. I love the detail moment where you take the music underwater when we're watching a volcano explode underwater and you like make it kind of muffled. But the, but the tonal choice that I think people really are so curious to hear about is like your collaboration with Miranda July in doing the narration. I mean, she was announced as your narr narrator, I think, right before the film went to Sundance, but I assume you'd already had her on board before that. Um, the narration that you wrote was a collaborative process, I've heard, from everybody. How was it working with her to get that to, to what, did you wind up writing any of the narration and kind of having her voice in mind? How did you direct her to deliver the narration in the style that you thought fit the film? And you know, talking to her, filmmaker to filmmaker, like how did all of these pieces fit together? Um, we, uh, Miranda actually came in um, pretty late in the process. Uh, she is an artist, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, well, for, how, how familiar are people with Miranda July? Raise your hand if you. No, for so a lot of people, but not right, not everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know Miranda July, she's just a, a phenomenal multi hyphenate artist. Who, she's a performance artist. She's an actor. She's a writer, a novelist, a short story writer. Um, she's a phenomenal Instagram <laughs> where she does uh, experimental dance. Um, but but she's truly talented um, in so many ways, and I, I feel like she particularly has has this way of. of of expressing kind of the, the strange and precarious beauty of what it means to be alive and in relationship with each other. Um, so to be a narrator for a love story just was like a, a dream come true for us. Uh, it wasn't an immediate choice. We actually thought we would have a French narrator for a while, um, seeing as Katia and Maurice were, were French. But during a brainstorming session, her name came up and we're instantly like, yes, Miranda would be great. Um, Part of that was in our collaborative writing process, we were trying to invoke kind of a, a, a tonal style that we were inspired by from French New Wave narrators, again, kind of taking the lead from Katia and Maurice, um, but we called it, between ourselves, deadpan curious. <laughs> and our um, editor, Jocelyn, one of our editors, Jocelyn, she was voicing the narration and she set this very kind of, it was at once monotone but playful, um, which I know feels oxymoronic to say that, but it, she did it. Um, and what that did, uh, it, it, the almost monotone sense 
allowed for a sense of space for Katya and Maurice's imagery and their own words to come into play. And um, it was really our goal to set up our writing as prompts, uh, as questions, um, rather than declarative truths or, or, or rather facts about Katya and Maurice. But it was always an interplay um, to the very last day of, of adding and then taking away, adding a little bit more, and then really taking away the, the narration. Yeah, and I, I think in general the process of writing narration is you you overwrite first. So we we would write what we wanted the film to say, and the narrator would be telling you everything that we wanted the film to say. But then, as Sarah was as Sarah was saying, we realized that actually it was in the the, the gaps and the interstices between understanding and meaning that the narrator would have the most profound articulation and enhancement of what you were seeing on screen with Katya and Maurice. Um, and then Miranda was perfect at that. And like as soon as we heard her voice, it was, it was as if she was meant to play the role. And I think as soon as she saw the film, she realized too that she had a very busy schedule, and it was a no first. I'm not doing anything. But then understood that this was this was her voice, and this was a voice she could access and and enliven. Yeah, and just to briefly to say about the collaborative process, she, she was amazing to work with. Um, she was so open uh, and brought so much of her, herself to the process. Um, once we did know she came on, which was probably in around like late, late, late November, um, uh, that's when we started, or no, it was, it was around late October, actually. Um, we recorded with her at the beginning of December of last year. Um, we did begin uh, begin to shape our writing a little bit more. We would say like, "Oh, how would Miranda say this?" and and specifically like the line about the the killer turnip. That was like, "Oh yeah, we could totally hear Miranda say this." So we're we're gonna go for this this kind of out there line because it felt authentically Miranda. So so things like that did help to to focus the process. But she was incredibly open and very collaborative um, and really fun to work with um, when we did did the recording with her. I love that, and I think that's a. A good segue to hear from some of the voices in this room to see who has a question, who would like to be our first questionnaire. Uh, yes, right there. Uh, I was curious about how you came to narrate in the first place, if you know any uh, changes to the story. Sure. So um, we first met Katya and Maurice in, in the last film we made together, um, which is a documentary entitled The Seer and the Unseen. That story follows um, an Icelandic woman named Rakan Hildur Jonsdotter, who is in communication with spirits of nature. Uh, we really think of that documentary as a magically real documentary, and um, we wanted the, the opening scene to be about the formation of Iceland, and Iceland is a volcanic island, so we thought archival footage of erupting volcanoes would, would do a good job of, of telling that story and kind of place it in a, a mythic kind of time. Um, so we began researching archival footage of erupting volcanoes in Iceland, and that's how we first learned about Katya and Maurice, because not, not many people had done that. Um, but it was really kind of once we learned about them as people, you know, the imagery was spectacular, but once we found out, you know, they're a married couple, they love each other, they're also in love with the earth, they're very philosophical and playful, that's when we thought, okay, maybe there's really a film here. Um, but we actually kind of put that on hold. Uh, we were entertained by that, but we started making a completely different film after we finished The Seer and the Unseen, um, a verite film that was going to be shot in Siberia, uh, but we were going to scout in April of 2020, and you know, the world had other plans for us. And <laughs> speaking of fate, <laughs> perhaps. But um, but yeah, and so that's when we thought we we were really hungry to make work somehow, still in isolation and lockdown, and and that's when we remembered, oh, there's this wonderful couple that had shot hundreds of hours of volcano footage. Wouldn't it be um, a meaningful endeavor to to try to access that and and tell their story during this time? So that's what kicked it off. Yes, right there. Um, so their their academic degrees. Um, Katya was a geochemist, and Maurice was a geologist. Uh, master's degrees, yeah. Um, I believe Katya was a master's student actually when when she met uh, Maurice. Um, but yeah, they were very much kind of higher education. Um, they never wanted to be professors, though. Um, that was something that they just discussed, and always wanted to be field scientists. So that's that's kind of why they they, uh, they did publish a fair amount, though. Um, but they weren't, you know, considered academics in in that kind of more uh, traditional sense. 
Um, in terms of their suits, I believe that they did design a lot of their suits um, or, or uh, contributed to, to the understanding of, of how to, to build those. Um, they're inspired by firefighters. Um, suits. Uh, it took a really long time though. Um, you know, at first there was more of the deep sea diver kind of metal helmets that then became asbestos suits later on that really enabled them to get closer. Um, but they're very much considered pioneers in kind of building the gear and especially the protective wear. Um, and it was really that desire to get closer than many people uh, had before that uh, drove that innovative process. Is there any more that? No, just that if there are any designers in the house tonight, we're looking for our suits as well. So if anyone can Halloween's coming up. Uh, yes, right here. If the question is about the sound of the film and the eruptions being so immersive and how that all came together. Uh, um, so yeah, that's a great question, one that we really love talking about. Um, as, as I mentioned, the 16 millimeter footage that they shot did not have uh, sync sound, um, which was very difficult for us because sound, of course, is, uh, is such an essential part of, of making a film. Um, our editors, Aaron Casper and Jocelyn Chapu, went to um, painstaking lengths to, to really research volcano sounds and work with geothermal and volcano library, sound libraries in actually building these soundscapes. Um, it was important to them to be scientifically accurate. Um, and at the same time, there, the fact that there wasn't sound kind of opened up a space too for subjective play. Um, again, like Katya and Maurice, we, we always wanted to start with them and uh, what felt like the most true and the most real to their experience. And they would often talk about volcanoes as like beasts, as monsters, as alive. And so because of that, we wanted to bring that feeling of sentience to the sound design as well. Um, and just one little anecdote I like to share is that um, in the scene in, in, in Indonesia in 1979 when they go to the Anak Krakatau volcano, Aaron was experimenting with putting uh, dinosaur sounds actually <laughs> uh, in with the eruptions, you know, the explosions. Um, it, it was very subtle. It's not like you felt like there was a snarling T-Rex at the base of the mountain at all, but, but you could perceive kind of like a hint of, of monstrosity there. And for us, that felt in line with how they perceived volcanoes. And so there was like the real, the factual, the scientific, and at once the subjective experience. And, and getting to play with that was, was such a joy for us. Um, we then worked with a, an amazing sound team in, based in Montreal, a, a sound designer named Patrice LeBlanc, who was able to take what Aaron and Jocelyn did and and kind of elevated it and went through a fully designed process too. And then we had a re-recording mixer named Gavin Fernandez who was just absolutely brilliant. And he especially played with kind of uh, the, not just the volume and the bombasticity of the sound, but also the directionality and was able to do things like, like in the scene in, in Mount Augustine in 1986 where the pyroclastic flow for the first time, you know, that they're, they're capturing, like he created this powerful sense of directionality where with the sound is concentrated in the middle channel. So you really kind of feel it coming towards you. So there, there's such creativity that working with this wonderful team um, afforded us. So yeah, it was really a joy. I have uh, bad news and good news. The bad news is that we've run out of time for more audience questions, but the good news is that there is a reception waiting downstairs, drinks, wine, alcohol, I believe even pizza, and these lovely people milling around to be talked to more about this wonderful film. Uh, first, I want to thank all of you for being here to see Fire of Love tonight. Uh, tell everybody they have to see this amazing film. And please join me in thanking Sarah and Shane for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you, IDA, for, for having us. This is really special for us.